This is Duke University. Hello and welcome. Uh, so um, pleased to have all of you here. I'm Charlie Lucas. I'm the grandson of Mary Stevens, the great grandson of Tony Bill. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm honored to have been asked to say a few words um, uh, before we get started. Um, my wonderful grandmother, uh, whom some of you knew, uh, endowed this lectureship in honor of her father. And you've had some incredibly distinguished speakers over the years, and today is no exception. Um, she uh, was always fascinated with her father's diplomatic career and, and very, very proud of it, and, and rightfully so. He was a remarkable guy, Tony Bill. He was born into um, you know, one of America's most distinguished families that, that traced their history back to the Mayflower. And uh, he was born in the, in the mid-1890s and, and was married at a very young age. Um, uh, to my great grandmother, and uh, he was an accomplished athlete. He served in World War One, um, uh, uh, enlisting as a private, and ended up as a captain. And then had a, um, a very interesting life in the 1920s, uh, in primarily in Palm Beach, New York. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. And and he uh, he did a lot of, of things, but but. In many ways, interestingly, honed his leadership skills by founding a number of different business ventures and clubs, and, and did many, many things. Uh, but after, uh, and I will say it, after a scandalous divorce in 1930, um, decided he needed to channel his energies elsewhere. And, and interestingly, he was he was incredibly charming, incredibly well dressed. He was always on the the ten best dress list. It's a very it, it, Funny how people watch that stuff, but still today he's thought of as a fashion icon in, in those days. Um, and so he's very charming, but he was also incredibly politically savvy. And and those two uh, qualities, his 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 ability to transcend politics with his charm, made him a fantastic diplomat. And uh, his first appointment was to, uh, as minister of Norway. He went on uh, to be ambassador to Poland. Uh, helped the Americans escape Poland during the Blitzkrieg of 1939, went on to one of the most important postings during the war as, as ambassador to the exiled countries, uh, which was, um, let's see, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Greece, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, um, Yugoslavia, and I'm uh, missing one, but, but one of the largest single appointments to, uh, of any diplomat in American history. Uh, went on that position transformed into a military position where he joined Eisenhower's staff, uh, helped plan Project Overlord, was on the shape staff that helped rebuild Europe, then served as adjutant general in Pennsylvania, and finally his final diplomatic post was as ambassador to Spain. He was appointed by President Kennedy, and he died as ambassador to Spain in 1961. A storied career, a very, very interesting and uh, um, amazing guy, and my grandmother uh, established this lecture to honor that very storied career. So it's an honor for me to be here and talk a little bit about it. I appreciate all of you being here, and I'm going to turn it over to our distinguished provost, who will introduce our speaker. Charlie, members of the Duke Biddle Trent Siemens family, friends, um, and Mary, in her absence, but always in our thoughts. It's my pleasure <coughs> to introduce Ambassador Donna Frenak as today's Anthony Joseph Dretzel Biddle Jr. Lecturer in International Studies. Uh, her topic today will be Latin America, more than just an asterisk. And she certainly brings a wealth of experience to the topic. In a period in which so much focus has been on the East and Southeast and South Asia, and in which there has been a public tilt toward close attention to China and U.S. foreign policy, it is probably only the older among us who remember the great prominence which Latin America had in U.S. foreign policy in the first three to four decades of the post-war period. Yet Brazil today is one of the BRICS, and several other countries appear to have emerged from their doldrums. And at the same time, we've also seen a revival of populism and anti-Americanism reminiscent again of some of those former days. It is in this context that Ambassador Rennick's talk today is so timely. 
She, cur she is currently the president of Boeing Brazil. And her current position follows a long and distinguished career of both private sector and public international service. Before assuming her current post, Ambassador Rinek was Vice President of Global Public Policy and Government Affairs at PepsiCo. She has served as UN Ambassador to Brazil, Venezuela, Bolivia, and the Dominican Republic, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Mexico and the Caribbean. I have to say that when I read this, I was thinking there used to be this thing which they called about going native. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking, I thought they moved you around the world, so they only moved you from country to country. Mary and next depend on your first tour, that will happen. I see. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to tell our students. She has also had assignments in Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, and Poland. Ambassador Rennick's honors include the U.S. government's Distinguished Public Service Award and the State Department's Career Achievement Award. In 2005, she was named International Businesswoman of the Year by the Miami chapter of the Organization of Women in International Trade. She serves on the board of directors of the Inter-American Dialogue and on the board of counselors of the McClarty Socialists. She is today based in Sao Paulo, although she also spends a good deal of time in Brazil. Ambassador Rinnick is obviously an ideal person to speak to us about whether Latin America is just an asterisk in today's world and in U.S. foreign policy and in the global development. Should it be? Can it be? Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Okay. Um, I have a 14-month-old grandson, and I hope that someday he gets up and says, my wonderful grandmother was in a group <laughs> like this. So thank you for the inspiration. It's a pleasure to be here at Duke, and a real honor to be invited to give the Anthony J. Drexel Biddle Jr. lecture. Someone said to me, you know, at Duke, this lecture is a big deal. For me, this lecture is a big deal. Shortly after I had um, my first conversation with um, Nancy Robbins about the possibility of my speaking to you today, you won't be surprised to hear that I went to the university website to see who had uh, given previous lectures, and nothing makes you think twice about your decision to accept than to realize that your predecessors include statesmen like uh, Vernon Walters and Bill Lures, and that you would be joining their illustrious company and might be compared to their presentation. It also includes a former colleague, John O'Leary, who was one of those private sector or political appointee ambassadors that we career officers were proud to serve with. And it includes, um, I won't say my old friend, but my friend of long standing, Diana Negroponte, whom I've known for at least 20 years. So that was all very encouraging. And then after I looked at the university website, I went to the Ultimate Oracle, Wikipedia, to read about, and man, I immediately began to think of as Tony Biddle. And I confess I had not known his story before, but it was uh, most interesting to learn about his role as both, uh, in both war and diplomacy at a time um, critical to the history of the United States and to the world. So while I'm sure you all hope that whoever um, gives the Biddle lecture actually offers some knowledge to the audience, I so far have actually been the one doing the learning. I'm also pleased to be at Duke as an employee of the Boeing Company. University relations are very important to Boeing, and Duke is one of our focal schools. Many Duke alumni have fun, found their way to Boeing. Um, I have the fun of working with one of the best. She works on strategy for Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Her name's Kate Heath, and she was kind enough to come down from Washington, D.C. to be here this evening. So, Kate, would you stand up, please acknowledge? Kate Heath. <laughs> In case you hadn't noticed, she's also a woman, which makes us very proud. Um, I also want to acknowledge someone else in the audience um, who I don't think needs a presentation to you, though. Um, Patrick Duddy and I worked together in Bolivia and then in Brazil, and then he, of course, was also ambassador to Venezuela. 
one of the um, smart things I learned in my career was to take Patrick's advice. And one of the smarter things I learned was to take Mary Duddy's advice. So thank you both for being here this evening. As I prepared for this visit, I couldn't help but remember the last time I was in North Carolina. I don't get here very often. The last time was when I was serving as ambassador to Venezuela. And I came to Hickory, North Carolina, to participate in the visit of Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. Chavez um, had been invited to Hickory by the then U.S. representative from that district, Cass Ballinger. And Cass and his wife, who um, was also named Donna, had taken a real interest in Latin America, sponsored several humanitarian projects in the region, and were getting increasingly concerned about Chavez's confrontational style back home, particularly toward the business sector. So they thought it would be a good idea if um, Hugo Chavez came to Hickory and saw how all elements of society work together to promote the community. So Chavez agreed, and he stopped uh, in Hickory on his way back from the summit in uh, uh, Canada. He spent a Sunday evening at a barbecue, and then the next day visiting various public-private partnerships, including um, the Catawba Valley Community College, where some recent immigrants from Latin America were um, learning uh, skills that would allow them to get jobs in local industries and training on state-of-the-art machinery, which those companies had provided to the school. Well, back in those days, Chavez was still speaking to U.S. ambassadors. And so um, he invited me to, to ride back to Venezuela on his plane, and I took advantage of that four-hour or so flight to ask him about his reactions to Hickory and whether he had been impressed by how the business sector could work together with other sectors of society and actually promote human and economic development. And he acknowledged that Hickory had an interesting experience. But then he said, but your business people aren't my business people. And I'm afraid that sums up about all that Hugo Chavez took away from his experience in Hickory. Now, when I speak to groups like this, um, the organizers are usually pretty specific about what topic they want me to address. The organizers usually say something like, uh, we want to hear about narcotics and the rule of law, or we want you to talk about women in politics in the Caribbean. And frankly, because those are subjects I've dealt with over many years, it's usually pretty easy to update my research and put some remarks together. But Nancy's guidance for this lecture was basically, um, you can talk about the world and life. Um, it reminded me of that old story of the journalist who um, is assigned to write an article and he revises it and, and rewrites it and finally turns it into his editor who says, well, this is pretty good. To which the journalist replies, yeah, it would have been better if I ha hadn't had so much time. I feel as if my remarks would be, better, would be better if I didn't have so much to talk about. But I was able to choose my topic thanks to Andres Oppenheimer's January 27th article in the Miami Herald. Many of you probably know Andres. He's a, an author of several books, syndicated columnist, and has a Spanish language television show called Oppenheimer Presenta. Um, I've known Andres for many years and always read his twice weekly columns. And on this particular day, he wrote about John Kerry's confirmation hearings to be Secretary of State. And according to Oppenheimer's calculations, and this reflects what Peter just said, the hearing focused about 70% on the Middle East and South Central Asia, 25% on Russia and China, and, and you can do the math, 5% on Latin America, 5%. Latin America, Oppenheimer con concluded in frustration, was an asterisk among the world's regions. Now, since I've spent most of my professional life either living in or working with the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, I immediately shared that frustration. But then I had to ask myself, why? Why should Latin America be more than just an asterisk for the United States or for any country outside the region? What does it matter to the world? And what does it matter to the region itself? I think it's important that we start with a definition. 
As a Brazilian diplomat once complained to me, there is no such place as Latin America. It's just some term you gringos have invented because you couldn't be bothered learning the differences among our countries. <laughs> now, that comment might just sound petty or facetious, but in fact, using one term to refer to countries from Mexico to Argentina has at times been actively harmful. As, for example, when investors shied away from Chile because they'd heard about political turmoil in Nicaragua. And when visitors canceled a trip to Uruguay because of a coup in Ecuador. Still, because the term is convenient, and because I do think we've become more sophisticated about distinguishing among our hemispheric neighbors, I'm going to use it this evening to describe the 17 predominantly Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries in the hemisphere. To me, one characteristic these countries do share is that when you consider their histories, it was not at all preordained that Latin America would thrive in the 21st century, that it would embrace, try to manage, or benefit from modern globalization. This is, after all, the region economist editor Michael Reed called the lost continent because it failed to show up, to make its views known, and to exert influence on so many global issues. In 2009, former president of Mexico, Ernesto Cedillo, wrote a paper he called 200 Years of Solitude to describe Latin America's choice, beginning with its independence, to not engage too broadly nor too deeply with the rest of the world as a way, he believes, of protecting its unique culture and identity. Well, after those 200 years, at the beginning of this century, that mindset in favor of isolation began to change. The countries of Latin America started to reach out more seriously and consistently to other parts of the world. They gained confidence as they understood they had important intellectual and material assets to bring to the global table. And they earned credibility with other nations because they made good decisions in their domestic policies. What did they do right at home? Well, first, they consolidated their democracies. The militaries were compelled to leave the presidential palaces, return to the barracks, and find democratic ways to become a national asset. Political parties overcame the ideological stalemate by learning the art of constructive compromise. Free and fair elections became the hemispheric norm. And because elections alone do not make a stable democracy. The countries of Latin America did something even more important. They took steps to make their democracies deliver, increasingly to deliver for every citizen every day. And they did so through a combination of responsible economic management and effective attention to social problems. The region brought its long, soaring inflation under control. Countries built up foreign reserves as a cushion against financial crisis. They controlled government spending to reach targets for deficit reduction. And they opened their economies to trade and investment. And at the same time, social inclusion, giving more people a stake in the system, became a top priority. In 1990, 48% of Latin America's population was poor. By 2010, that number had fallen to 32%, still unacceptably high, but real progress. In Brazil alone, between 2002 and 2010, over 40 million people, approximately one-fifth of Brazil's population, moved out of poverty and into the middle class. And so a very virtuous circle began to develop. As economic stability led to more inclusive growth, support for both democracy and free enterprise rose. For example, according to the polling agency Latino Barometro, in Peru, where growth has averaged 6% per year since 2002, support for democracy increased from 40% in 2005 to 59% in 2011. 
Throughout the region, 34% of people say they have faith in their country's Congress. Not such a high percentage, perhaps, but more than double the 14% endorsement of Congress coming from recent surveys in the United States. <laughs> and 71% of people polled in Latin America say private enterprise is indispensable for development. Even in Venezuela, 62% say the market economy is the only system that will make their country develop. Of course, the strongest evidence that Latin America has achieved a solid record of good policies and has best practices to share with the rest of the world was seen in how the region weathered the 2008-2009 recession. Except for those economies most closely tied to the United States, those in Mexico and Central America, the countries of the region were the last to fall into recession. Their drops were less deep than in other parts of the world, and they were the first to emerge from the downturn. In the words of a World Bank report, Latin America proved it is globalized, resilient, and dynamic. So, how is this dynamic, resilient region engaging with the rest of the world? Who cares what's going on in Latin America? And what are they doing about it? Answering that question really demands that we look more closely at individual Latin countries, or at least as sub-regions, the Andes or the Southern Cone, perhaps. But there are a few relevant and important observations to make about the region as a whole. Perhaps the topic we hear about most often is how China is becoming a more important player in the region. In fact, in 2001, then-Chinese President Jiang Zemin said that the 21st century would be one of Chinese-Latin American cooperation, quote, in all areas, hand in hand. And in, just one year later, in 2002, China overtook Japan as Latin America's main Asian trade partner. Chinese direct investment in the region is also growing. But its relations with Latin America remain centered on commodities, obtaining raw materials like copper, crude oil, and iron ore, and agricultural product, products, including meat and soy. And while at the beginning of this century, many Latin countries were infatuated with the prospect that China would offer them a more balanced economic relationship and more political solidarity than they had ever achieved with the developed world, they have since been forced to contemplate the reality that China is often pushing manufactured goods into their home markets in exchange for no value-added commodities. In fact, nearly 90% of Latin America's exports to China are from mining and agriculture. From the other side, the Chinese side, it's interesting to consider what China believes is important watching in Latin America. The Institute of Latin American Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences issued for 2011 a top 10 list of events in Latin America. Leading the list at number one was the deepening of Chinese Latin American ties, albeit with what the Institute called areas of disharmony, which included Mexican President Felipe Calderon's meeting with the Dalai Lama and what the Institute called Argentine protectionism against Chinese products. Number two on the list, the Institute described as the new economic model of market statism in Cuba. And number three was the creation of CELIC, the community of Caribbean and Latin American nations with its pointed exclusion of the United States. This third top event was cited by the Chinese and is as an example of definitive rejection of U.S. hegemony in the region. Now, according to China watchers, item five on the list, student protests in Chile registered particular concern among Chinese leaders who, since Tiananmen Square, remain vigilant against signs that student demonstrations might spread to wider unrest and instability anywhere in the world. Makes you wonder what they thought about the Middle East that year. While China's activities in the region have gotten much attention, the new Latin American orientation of the second Asian BRIC country, India, has been much less noticed, although that is beginning to change. In 2010, the Inter-American Development Bank published a report entitled 
India, Latin America's next big thing, with a question mark. And the spring 2011 issue of America's Quarterly included a feature story on the other brick in Latin America. As that article noted, the India-Brazil relationship in particular has grown strong, including with the founding of IBSA, IBSA, the group bringing together India, Brazil, and South Africa. And I know one of the alphabet soup of new organizations of which Brazil has become a part. Indian investments in Latin America are now at $12 billion and growing. And while, like China, India also wants and needs Latin America's commodities, especially energy and agricultural exports, Indian investments have a different character, generally coming from the private sector, not state-owned companies. As one example, Tata Consultancy Services already employs 8,000 people in the region and continues to expand. For Latin countries aspiring to move more forcefully into the global knowledge economy, Indian high-tech investments are highly sought. And when you look at the world from Brazil, as I now do, it's impossible not to think about Latin America and Africa. Brazilian President Lula, in particular, prioritized his country's relations with Africa, himself traveling to the continent 11 times and visiting 25 countries as president. Brazil now has 37 embassies in Africa, more than double the number in 2000. President Rousseff has continued Lula's pattern, such as with her February visit to Nigeria, where she signed with her counterparts an agreement that targeted cooperation in agriculture, energy, and aviation, as well as highlighting the cultural and historical bonds that bind the two countries. Brazilian business and industry have also been active in Africa. The Brazilian conglomerate Odebrecht, for example, is today the largest private sector employer in Angola. Given that many Brazilians feel a natural affinity for Africa, Brazil, of course, has the largest African descendant population outside the African continent itself, it's been hard for them to understand that Brazil's rising role in the region is under scrutiny. On her latest trip to Africa last month to attend the BRICS summit in Durban, Rousseff and her presidential colleagues faced the skepticism of many Africans about what they term the new colonialism in the continent. For a Latin country which experienced years of protest against U.S. imperialism, having its own motives questioned as imperialistic has been quite a shock. And so we're back to the United States and Latin America and to Andres's asterisk. What do Latin America and the U.S. mean to each other today? Well, in the commercial area, according to the International Trade Commission, the value of U.S. goods shipped to Latin America in 2011 was three times the amount shipped to China. 22% of oil imports come from the region, with Mexico being the second biggest supplier after Canada. While investment in Latin America from China and India is growing, the U.S. continues to account for 40% of foreign direct investment into the region. And in contrast to commodity flows with Asian trading partners, over half of Latin America's manufactured exports come to the United States. Of course, the United States has traditionally been the leading outside political, social, cultural influence in Latin America. But the U.S. now struggles to craft a policy that approaches our hemispheric neighbors, not as younger siblings who must be led, but as mature partners. The quest to find the right balance in the relations between the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean is not easy, and it's not new. As Peter mentioned, I'm on the board of the Inter-American Dialogue, which periodically publishes a report on regional policy. The latest report, issued a year ago in April 2012, was called Remaking the Relationship and attempted to stem what it called the drift and distancing in relations by pointing to concrete opportunities for productive cooperation. Sounds pretty good, right? 
Well, in 2005, the Dialogues Report was called A Break in the Clouds, which lamented how the U.S. and Latin America had grown apart and proposed a series of initiatives to restore priority to Latin America in Washington's foreign policy agenda. Also very positive. But then there was the 1991 report, whose title was Changing U.S. Policies and Interests in the New World and which talked about Latin America's steadily dropping importance to the United States. It also included a comment that the biggest factor influencing U.S.-Latin America relations would be the United States' ability to get its own economic and political agenda in order, which was the theme again in the 2012 report. And in addition to periodic reports like these from the Dialogue and other think tanks, we see articles in various media with titles like Adios Amigos, How Latin America Stopped Caring What the U.S. Thinks, which appeared in Foreign Policy. Or U.S. Sway Clipped in Latin America, published in the Wall Street Journal. Much of this wrangling represents the fact that for too long, the United States was either to bless or to blame for everything that happened in Latin America a more nuanced role, an engagement with our neighbors, which President Obama has described as having no senior or junior partner, is highly desirable. And increasingly, both the United States and Latin America, I think, understand that. You've all heard Obama's comment about the U.S. pivot toward Asia. Well, there's never going to be a pivot toward Latin America an overwhelming focus of U.S. foreign policy attention on this region. And for most of the hemisphere, that's more and more okay. As one book title put it, how South America stopped listening to the United States and started prospering. But it's also essential that we do focus seriously on creating the mature partnership essential for the United States, for the region, and for the world. For the countries of Latin America will be key to successfully managing some of the most pressing global problems. Take energy. Well, South America holds 20% of the world's proven oil resources. Or well, food security, where the region accounts for 12% of the world's arable land. Or well, climate change, with the Amazon rainforest alone produces more than 20% of the world's oxygen. Indeed, for the future of all our hemisphere and its influence in the world, it is critical to establish a mature partnership between, in this hemisphere, our North and South. There's one other element critical to the growth and development of our hemisphere, and I want to mention it here tonight because that element is education. And for Latin America, education is job one in being competitive and productive and staying relevant in the 21st century. In the OECD's annual survey, the proficiency of 15-year-olds in math, science, and reading comprehension Latin America as a region ranks next to last, just slightly above sub-Saharan Africa. The Latin country ranked highest, Chile, is in 44th place. One company I know personally had its own wake-up call about education in Latin America several years ago when it acquired a food manufacturing company in Brazil's northeast. The labor force they inherited was simply not able to make the transition to the new manufacturing processes and standards, so the company had a 100% turnover, hired an entirely new group of employees who met the education requirements for the line jobs, which was completion of an elementary education. Unfortunately, it soon became apparent that while the new employees had spent the required time in school, they still lacked basic reading and math skills needed for the jobs. So like many companies before, and I'm afraid since, 
management accepted that providing basic education for its employees was a company, not a public sector responsibility. Brazil's President Dilma Rousseff understands that Brazil cannot aspire to global leadership if this situation continues. She has announced the creation of the Science Without Borders, or Brazilian Scientific Mobility Program, to train 100,000 Brazilian students in the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, in the best universities around the world. 75,000 of these students will be supported by government scholarships. President Dilma expects the other 25,000 to receive funding from the private sector. Of course, the catch is that to qualify for the Dukes, the MITs, the Stanfords, and their equivalents in other parts of the world, Brazilian students will have to be better prepared, starting from preschool. The business leaders I've spoken with are willing to do their part in supporting scientific mobility, but they also want government to make educational quality a priority beginning with pre-kinder. I'm proud to say that my company, Boeing, is working at both ends of the education spectrum in Brazil. We support Brazilian scientific mobility by sponsoring all the aeronautics and aerospace students accepted, not just by paying their scholarships, but by assigning each of them a Boeing mentor to work with their academic advisors, and by offering them a summer program in Puget Sound at Boeing Commercial. We are also working with the Secretary of Education in the Rio City government to introduce a lifelong interest in science beginning in the preschool years using the Jim Henson Foundation's program, SID, the Science Kid. Boeing's involvement responds to another item on the region's education agenda, the importance of linking academia and the private sector. In most of Latin America, unlike in Boston or Silicon Valley or the North Carolina Research Triangle, academia is not considered an instrument of economic development. Research is theoretical rather than practical and accordingly doesn't contribute to innovation and competitiveness. Statistics tell the tale. In 2009, for example, there were 8,000 800 patents registered in South Korea. In Brazil, there were 103 registrations. In Mexico, 60. A real public-private partnership on education could contribute importantly to improving the record on innovation and to making this hemisphere a real global contender. Luis Alberto Moreno, president of the Inter-American Development Bank, has channeled Horace Greeley by exhorting U.S. business and political leaders to become more involved in this hemisphere by saying, go south, my friends, go south. As someone who has devoted most of her life to Latin America, I share that guidance. But don't go south as an end in itself. Though there is a way to move this hemisphere, east and west, down to touch the ocean's depths, and up to explore the universe. And because a strong United States is still the most reliable anchor for all of us. Let's also remember to come home. Thanks very much. Oh, absolutely. The questions are the best part. The floor is open to questions. But people have to ask questions. That's what makes it the best part. Yeah. yeah. Could I ask you two related questions or semi-related? One, uh, this is the Professor Schultz from UNC Chapel. The word Cuba did not escape your lips. Yes, it did. It did? Talking about the Chinese list of top ten. <laughs> no. Okay, but that aside, no, yeah. US it escaped. It escaped right. yeah. uh, fair enough. Uh, also, I noted at the beginning you, you quoted Andres Oppenheimer in uh, somewhat dismay 
commented that only about 5% of the attention of U.S. policy uh, is focused on Latin America. And there's a certain difficulty in using journalists for that type of, of data because Andres Oppenheimer is a journalist. He, he published a book in 1993, I think it was called Castro's Final Hour. And, uh, but, but my question uh, really is asking for a comment. Do you really think it's a poor idea that only 5% of U.S. foreign policy interest is focused on Latin America? In my lifetime, every time we focused heavily on Latin America is because there's some disaster and we move into an environment where we eventually feel that we probably should have not spent as much of our energy in the region. Yeah, at that time, to suggest I don't think any arbitrary percentage is what's relevant here. It's relevant what kind of a relationship we have and whether that relationship is one of responding to crises because we think somehow we have a, a role in, in cleaning up the mess, if you will, um, or whether we have the kind of a partnership that on a day-to-day -day basis looks at what's of mutual interest um, to both the United States and the region and even broader interest to the world, and can we work on that kind of an agenda together? Um, so I don't, as I said, you know, I, there's never going to be a pivot toward Latin America. No, I don't expect that, and I don't think that's necessary. I don't think it's necessarily good for the region. Um, when I quoted that book title about um, stop listening to, Latin, to the United States and start prospering, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for the fact that when Latin America felt that it was um, not receiving enough attention from the United States, and it has gone back and forth, right? It's either not receiving enough attention or it's receiving too much attention. But when it started in this century believing that it didn't receive enough attention, it started in many cases taking much more responsibility for its own problems. And I, Lula said it, you know, this is not something I've invented. Lula said when he was a candidate, um, for years, um, we have looked at Europe and the United States and said, um, they're rich and strong and we're poor and weak. Why is that the case? Well, it must be their fault. And he said, it's not their fault. It's our fault. We're the ones who create our destiny. So um, I think you know, when you see Lula's evolution, to ha when he reached, um, to have him reach that point, I think that shows that that was a, you know, a perception that was growing in Latin America. And, um, and so, no, I think that, you know, is 5% right? Who knows? You know, is 1.3% right? The point is, is it a constructive, productive relationship for both sides and, and for the rest of the world? And on Cuba, i got to tell you, um, <laughs> just in case it comes up again. Okay, so... Um, I have a lot of former State Department colleagues here, some of whom have been in Latin America. There have traditionally been, um, there were traditionally when I was in the State Department, um, two ways of dealing with um, Cuba policy. One way was to be a true believer and embrace it, and the other way was to go as far away from the policy as you possibly could. Um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I was at really a very, um, um, strong point in the Reagan administration in Cuba um, was about as far as I could get. Yeah. And you know, and I don't say, I, it sounds flip, but yeah, I don't mean that fliply. I served in Warsaw in the old days, when it was communist Poland, 77 to 79. And we did everything we could to promote exchange between Poland and the United States, to get speakers into Poland, to get professors to come to the States and, and have university experiences here. And uh, we don't, we do nothing like that with Cuba, and today Poland is free, and Cuba is not. So I think it's just, you know, reality. Yes? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering about the end when you were talking about education in Latin America, and I was wondering about the digital turn in education and kind of like this new push to these online classes and open things up to the world. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about uh, the private sector versus the public sector partnership and whether they're addressing that or how they're trying to incorporate kind of digital education. Well, it depends greatly on the country, right? Um, let one laptop per child has been embraced in, in many places and in some countries and they have really 
made the effort in smaller countries to have one laptop per child. I think Uruguay has, in, in particular, um, adopted that as a policy. Brazil, a you know, huge country, has shown some interest in certain um, parts of the education system. One of the issues is that mo in most places in Latin America, um, certainly Brazil is an example of this, um, at the elementary education is local, um, municipal, sometimes state, and then high school education is um, state and some, but following a very strict curriculum um, that is largely nationwide um, if they stick in the public schools to that <laughs> curriculum. So um, it's difficult to um, take a policy like one laptop for a child if you're talking about a country of 200 million people and um, trying to institute that as a, as a national education policy. One of the big issues in some places, and again, you know, I, I, I've lived in Brazil more than any country outside the United States, right? I'm not Brazilian in this life, but I was in a previous life. Um, <laughs> my grandson is Brazilian, right? So that's, um, anyway, the um, one thing that happens in, in Brazil, and they've been trying to correct this, but they've just had another downturn in the statistics is, there's great public education at the university level, and it's free. And to get into a public university, you have to pass sort of an equivalent of the SAT, which is something called the vestibular. And to pass the vestibular, um, you largely need to have had the kind of education that you can get only in a private high school. And then you need to take a year to study for the vestibular, which means that your parents are basically paying for you to sit home and paying extra money for this private course so that you can get into a free public university. Result is that most of the students at good public universities in Brazil come out of private schools. Um, they just, there was um, a new article in the paper this morning in one of the Sao Paulo papers saying that um, the percentage of public school students in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo, which is generally considered to be the highest ranked university in Brazil among the global 200, has actually fallen um, from uh, 2011 to 2012. So they're, they're also heading in the wrong direction. Um, you know, getting the private sector to step up and support education is, I think, um, uh, laudable. I think you know, there are ways the public and private sectors can collaborate um, to improve education. But it's, you know, it shouldn't be, I think, a company's role to train its labor force in how to add one and one, right? I mean, there is a certain responsibility the state has to fulfill for education. Um, certainly looking to the private sector, um, the way at Catawba Community College, you know, to train people in the basic skills that are going to provide jobs for the private sector um, is, I think, desirable and appropriate. But, you know, when companies like, like Boeing, I mean, we want to help. Sid the Science Kid, yeah, Sid the Science Kid is great. And the fact that we're doing it in two pilot schools in Rio that are bilingual private schools, first time in Rio public school history that they're having bilingual education at the primary level. That, I think, is, um, you know, is a very encouraging sign that the Rio system has stepped up also. But we're not going to reach every kid in Rio with Sid the Science Kid. I mean, the public sector is going to have to provide basic science education, right? The one thing I'll tell you that really is encouraging is people are talking about this in Latin America. I mean, for years, did anybody talk about education in Latin America? People from the embassy, right? We were the only ones talking about education. Um, now, Almost everybody talks about education. There's a paper in Rio that's like a scandal sheet. It comes out in the afternoon, right? And it's either the picture on the front is always um, you know, bloody or uh, a, a typical uh, sensationalism yeah, or, or uh, you know, a, a typical uh, Brazilian samba girl wearing no clothes. Um, I was in Rio a few weeks ago, and the front page of the paper was a debate about education in Rio. Now, that I think is progress. Well, I am Brazilian originally. Mm. Okay. Right? Everything I'm saying is right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. No doubt. Um, I'm Brazilian originally. Mm -hmm. I'm Brazilian originally. Mm -hmm. And um, I am and made um, education compulsory. 
So, um, and more than compulsory, what happened was like parents would be arrested if the kids were not in school. So what happened was the middle class and upper middle class, and obviously I come from upper middle class. My mother was a teacher in the public school system. Um, they all got together and decided to take their kids from the public school system and put them in the best private school, and obviously the best one for the Catholic school. So, you know, I ended my whole life at the But I would like to go back to the point um, that you were talking about uh, not a long time ago. I can't remember exactly if, if it was a global, it's a newspaper, a big newspaper in Brazil, or Police São Paulo, that said that the U.S. government has just signed a, uh, an exchange program with the state of Sao Paulo. And for the first time, um, it's a big program that actually a country, a nation, you know, uh, had signed with the state. From an, uh, so I would like to know exactly what it, what it is about, because I, I didn't quite understand what, it, what they were, you know, but it had to do with education. I actually saw that article, I think. I just, I just want to make one comment on something you said relevant to the last question, too, because, you know, one of the Millennium Development Goals is universal primary education, right? Latin America is going to meet that goal. In fact, um, the head of the Latin America economic system a few weeks ago gave a um, talk on Latin America's achievements and the Millennium Development, Go Development Goals, and she basically ch checked this one off. The question is quality of education, right? right? Not whether kids are in school anymore. Yeah, yeah because sorry. exactly. Like yeah. my nephews, that I'm the only one here, so my whole family is down there, and I have nephews in school in private. Of, of course, they're all in private schools, and the private schools um, have wonderful in terms of technology. You know, they have everything needed. The classroom is really small. They have about 15 to 20 students. But, you know, um, you, you need to have a very high income uh, to pay for the, you know, the tuition for those schools. Anyway. But, um, you know, going back to this project, I thought it was quite interesting, but I didn't quite understand what they wanted to uh, Yeah, I didn't understand that article either. I know which one you said. <laughs> <laughs> The reason I didn't understand it was that it made such a point of this. This is the first time the U.S. government has signed an agreement with the state. When we were down there, remember, Patrick, we had the agreement with the state of Sao Paulo um, against human trafficking, for example. So this is something that's you know, been going on in this region, and I suspect all around the world for a long time. So that didn't make any sense to me. I mean, there is you know, the reverse project from the states, and I talked about the 100,000 signs without borders. or so. Some other, Brazil started out, calling this program Signs Without Borders, which sounds really nice, right? Ciencias Sem Fronteiras. Turns out there's another group up here in the United States that's already trademarked that. So they had to change it to Brazilian Scientific Mobility, which is why I keep using both, because I like the first one better. Um, but there's a reverse program, you know, to send 100,000 students from the U.S. to Latin America, university <coughs> students, right, um, that um, President Obama has, um, has announced. But that one article, I sort of looked at that and thought, I'm, I, I, this isn't right, so I'm not going to read it. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> now you're going to have to make me go back and I'm going to have to read it and figure out what the rest is, because maybe there's some kernel of truth in that article. Yeah. Yes? Let me get back to Cuba. <laughs> Okay, see, this is what's wrong with Cuba, if I may say so. Sorry. This is what's wrong with U.S. policy in Cuba, because every conversation about Latin America goes through Cuba. And that, you know, if we would just have normal relations with Cuba, this would not be affecting our relations throughout the hemisphere. So I hope that doesn't stop you from asking your question. <laughs> You're asking my question better than I. Uh, how can we get major universities to pay for the education of their students? Not hostility, but otherness. Portuguese, Spanish, <coughs> South America, North America, not the hostilities, but how can we define the common interests? And your not too large a question either. In your own personal experience and your own personal desire and your dreams at night, <coughs> as an experienced people. You know, there are more and more issues where I think that's possible. And it's possible in part because of the growth of the NGO movement in Latin America. Um, you know, more links between 
communities in different parts of the hemisphere, among communities in different parts of the hemisphere around um, particular issues um, that they all feel a, a common sense of responsibility toward. Uh, I think the environment is one of those issues, and I think it's a, a, one of the issues that millenniums embrace, um, you know, the, the younger generation. Um, I, think if, I think a university that wants to play that role probably should look at where its sweet spot lies among those topics that are of interest to um, civil society groups in Latin America. You know, I wouldn't look at what the government say are important. I'd look and say, what, what do the grassroots say is important and try to, to support them there. First of all, I think that's where the a university has more value add, frankly. Um, some of these groups are not very um, you know, well um, the schooled, well experienced in how to turn a, a sort of a feeling into a social movement, if you will, and to really build up civil society. So maybe that's a way. My dreams at night are usually about losing 10 pounds, but that's another story. <laughs> yes? Thank you, Ambassador. One question for you. Do you think that at some point the United States will regret not paying attention to Latin American Serbs, especially in countries with you know, certain anti-American rhetoric? So you know when that's going to be? Any of you watch Modern Family? Okay. Okay. Right. Any of you see the episode recently where you have this little baby now, right? The, um, the father and his trophy wife um, have this little baby. And um, the, the, if you haven't watched the show, right, the wife is Colombian, very beautiful, Sofia Vegata, right, beautiful woman. And um, she's speaking to the baby in Spanish. And her husband, totally um, from the States, doesn't speak any Spanish, comes up to her and says, you know, um, when he calls the DMV, if you keep talking to him like that, he's going to have to push number two. And she says, by the time he's old enough to call the DMV, it'll be number one. <laughs> so, you know, I talk about my, my grandson. I, 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 um, I talk about my son a lot because I think he's a hemispheric citizen, right? He was born in Brazil, so he's a, and he got Brazilian citizenship because we weren't on the dip list. We were on the consular list at the time. His father's Mexican. And he lives in the United States, and he covers Latin America in his job. And I think he feels as strongly about being a, a U.S. citizen through me as he does. He tells everybody he's Brazilian, right? So I think the paying attention is going to somehow be forced on us. It, it won't be the pivot. It won't be a policy decision. It won't be the government that does it. It will be through, I think, rising um, Latin population in this country and um, the increasing family ties back to, to home countries. Does that make any sense? Sure. Where are you from originally? Ecuador. Ecuador. From Quito? Yes. I've been there for quite a while. I want students. You look like a student. <laughs> are you a student? Uh, yes, okay. Thank you again for coming today. Um, I was wondering um, how do you see the future of American companies doing business in Latin America and what possible effects are keeping the asterisks or potentially engaging more um, would have on our uh, conducting business in the region. So Kate, do you want to take that? No. Um, I was being persistent. It's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, U.S. companies at one time um, had a really close bond with the U.S. government in the region, and sometimes that wasn't a very happy. It wasn't a very happy result from that, right? As we all know, if you go, you go back to Guatemala in the in the 50s, right? Um, that bond isn't as strong anymore. Companies are sort of going about their business in the hemisphere because it's easier in many cases to do that. The countries are more open. You don't need the embassy fighting for you all the time unless you're selling super hornets to the Brazilian Air Force. Um, but you don't need the embassy fighting for you all the time because company, countries welcome this investment, right? Communities welcome the investment. You talk about states. You know, states within a country uh, provide all kinds of incentives for a company to to locate in, in their um, uh, area rather than in some other part of their own country, even in small countries. Um, so I think that whether or not Latin America is important in the foreign policy sense, um, 
If you look at some of the big U.S. consumer companies in particular, look at a General Electric, has, and they're both consumer and not, but you know, they've been in Brazil for 95 years. General Motors has been down there for like 98 years. People tell me that General Motors, Brazilians say, Brazilians think General Motors is a Brazilian company because they see the cars being manufactured in Brazil, they go to the dealership, and everything is in Portuguese, so why wouldn't they? So I think, and it's not just U.S. companies, like it's some other countries' companies too. Not as easily as for U.S. companies, but some of them are also able to establish themselves as, you know, pretty sort of local brands. Hyundai is doing an amazing um, advertising campaign in Brazil now, that they're part of central Brazil, right? All, you know how Brazil is sort of, it has been so unbalanced, right? All the population is right along the, the coast. Hyundai has a big factory going up in Goiás, which is a state in the, um, in the center part of Brazil. And that sending that message that they're part of that area of Brazil is, is a very strong part of what of their advertising down there. So I think companies have, you know, it, I was just thinking, when you asked that question, this isn't really relevant, you weren't going in the same direction, but um, when I was at the embassy in Brazil, there were a lot of Bush administration policies that weren't very popular um, in Brazil. Right? We defended them all the time, but they weren't very popular. Um, and I had a, a um, large U.S. company from um, based in Houston who came to call on me, and he said, "You know, it's really hard to do business down there. All I hear about is, you know, war in Iraq, and you, and, and, you know, you got to do something to stop that." <laughs> so you are a huge political contributor in the United States. You've got to do something to stop that, right? Because I knew that was going to be my last assignment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I'll tell you. I don't mean to talk about Boeing all the time, but you know, I, 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 Boeing's a great company, by the way. But um, Boeing has been doing business in Brazil for um, 80 years. Right? We've been, we sold our first um, planes to the Brazilian government. It wasn't even the Brazilian Air Force yet back in 1932, 14 F-4Bs. Um, we sold our first commercial plane to Varig uh, in 1960, 707. We established a permanent presence in Brazil last year. So you know, we're also looking at Latin America differently, and I think it's not just us. We're looking at Latin America more and more uh, as a research and technology play. You know, we, there is good science being done in Brazil. There's good science being done in other places in Latin America. But it never reaches commercialization. That, that gap, right? There's this big gap between academia and, and the private sector. So research doesn't become innovation. And so we think we've got a lot of good experience that we can um, bring um, to, to help make that, that leap. And General, General Electric is putting in a $100 million research center in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. So as I say, I don't think we're the only ones, right? Lots of companies are doing this. There's a long answer to the question. I think a couple more questions. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll go there. Okay. Yes. So going back to the science without borders, the program you know. Yeah. So this student goes, goes to, let's say, MIT, have received a world-class education. And when he's done, he can go back to Brazil because Brazil doesn't offer any labs where he can continue the research. So, uh, and the outcome of the research will take way, way more time to reach and does and do some effect in Brazil because he's gonna he 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 remain overseas. So, how a program of that can be sustainable in the long term if uh, Brazil is not investing on infrastructure and uh, giving them the resources? Uh, Enough resources for those scientists. Ser brasileiro também, né? So, carioca. Carioca, yeah, another Brazilian. Um, yeah, well, there are several parts to science without borders, right? The, uh, most of the 100,000 students are intended to go in their junior years. So they come back to their home universities in Brazil and finish out their education. Um, there are other programs for grad students and even for um, visiting professors back and forth. But the bulk of them are the sandwich years, they call it in Brazil. Um, some of them will come back, and we hope 
do things like work at the Boeing Research and Technology Center, right? We don't want the kids we're sponsoring to work for Boeing in Washington State. We want them to work for Boeing in Brazil. And I, so people, you know, I say well, we support science without borders, and some people say, oh, isn't that cute, you know, as part of their corporate social responsibility? Uh-uh. It's a business decision, right? We want to support these students because there's, um, you know, how many engineers are going to retire over the next 10 years and how, many, how few we have to replace them that are actually in the pipeline. Um, at the same time, so there's private sector opportunities, I think, are growing in Brazil to absorb some of these students. Not all of them, obviously, but some. Um, there are a few pockets of um, Brazilian companies that can absorb these students right now to Embraer being one of them, right? Um, but there's also a much greater emphasis being put on innovation and competitiveness from the government and from Banu Dese, the Brazilian National Development Bank. You might have seen an article recently about um, uh, Lucio Coutinho, who's the president of the development bank, saying we're no, we're no longer picking national champions. We're, not, we're no longer going to put money into you know, a particular company and say this is our winner in what sector or another. But there's a big new program on innovation. Um, they will work to, um, to establish labs. They'll work with universities to try to get to Brazil to be a center of, of research and technology too. Now, will this absorb 100,000 students? No. Will some of these students probably go back to Korea or, or Germany or the United States where they have done their junior year? Yeah, they probably will. But is this a cluster, a, you know, a, a critical mass of students in Brazil that I think can come together with this new government emphasis and really make a change? I think it is. I'm too optimistic for you, I can tell. But. <laughs> I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, to the very beginning of the talk when you gave that really interesting anecdote from your conversation with Chavez after his visit to North Carolina. And uh, well, Chavez is not was never particularly good at nuance, as we know. Um, but his answer to you, our businessmen aren't like your businessmen. But for those of us who study you know, Latin American history, for example, I mean, there it's there's there's a, there's a kernel of truth to that, right? We're talking about you know ten barons in Bolivia, like catorce familias in El Salvador. Or, you know, historically, a very small group of people whose interest in business has not been to expand the realm of popular participation or to uh, have any sort of philanthropic mission, but primarily to enrich themselves. Uh, so I'm going to give examples from contemporary Latin America of not so much U.S. businesses working in Latin America, but Latin American corporations themselves, uh, developing a broader social consciousness or philanthropic vision and using their public-private partnerships, not just themselves, which of course is what businesses are supposed to do, right? Um, but also to try to increase social inclusion or things like that. Yeah. Um, well, I agree with you about what, what you said about Chavez and about Venezuela in particular, um, by the way. The, um, yeah, I, I lived in Venezuela the first time. I was political counselor back during the Caracaso. So, you know, the Caracaso, um, many of you probably know, was this riot, week-long riots that occurred shortly after Carlos Andres Perez was inaugurated as president for the second time when he raised the price of gasoline and a lot of other prices um, went up. And at least the government has admitted to 300 people being killed. There are estimates that up to 1,500 people were killed that week. And the political and, and economic establishment in the country after the riots ended sort of rolled over and went back to sleep. It should have been a wake-up call. It was not. Um, so uh, that, that's, um, he does have a, a kernel of truth in that. Um, I guess I would feel somewhat more sympathetic toward that if I didn't think that the business people that Chavez did cozy up to um, weren't just as corrupt and um, self-interested as the ones that he was um, railing against. Um, you know, I'm a child of the um, Vietnam era, right? So. Um, there were two things. I came into government. It's kind of strange um, to choose government. But I came in with not a whole lot of respect for two institutions. One was the U.S. private sector, and the other was the U.S. military. And um, I learned, I matured, I joined the Foreign Service when I was 22, right, fresh out of school. Um, I learned um, through my career that um, both of those institutions um, were worthy of respect and that I had been wrong. Um, the military being the last ones who want to go to war because they're the ones who are actually out there fighting the war. And the U.S. private sector was often setting the standard, particularly in Latin America, for corporate social responsibility, for social inclusion. 
um, you know, big foundations, like for the Ford Foundation, the big U.S. moneyed corporations, family fun, uh, foundations in some cases, were down in Latin America um, you know, working in, um, in areas that were um, taboo to a lot of Latins, that, uh, Latin companies that were focused just on making profits. They didn't accept the responsibility for their country. So I think in many cases it was the example of U.S. companies that made a difference. And I think you can go to almost any country in Latin America and find um, a few examples of companies that have stepped up and gone beyond. I think the Gerdau family in Brazil is one example, Jorge Gerdau with the steel company, and they bought steel companies in the United States too. I think the Volmers in Venezuela, um, or, right? Or Polar. Or Polar in Venezuela, both of them um, have done that. Um, You know, I don't know about El Salvador since you talked about that um, specifically, but um, you know, I think that you can go almost anywhere and find an example now of a Latin company um, that realizes that it's both in its own interest and in the country's interest to do this, right? You know, corporate social responsibility isn't sustainable if you think of it as charity, right? It's not charity. It's, it's doing well while, while doing good. All right, thank you. Can I take one more? Sure. Yeah, I'll just, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Are you a student? No, we not. No. Oh, then no. No, no. <laughs> I would like to be. <laughs> would like to be. <laughs> um, on the question or the issue of um, collaboration between business and education, uh, there are already um, a few examples in the United States of major universities that have set up centers in Brazil, for example. Um, Harvard and Columbia and University of Illinois have great centers and they're working with corporate sponsorship and they're um, having exchanges of research. And you know, if Duke were to want to um, develop a, a similar project uh, where we exchange um, knowledge of our professors, scientists, and researchers with foundations in Brazil or institutes of higher education, and we wanted to work with businesses, what would be the most strategic issues and themes that you would think um, we, we should focus on? Mm. I should ask a Duke professor to answer that. <laughs> well, not aerospace, because I went to Michigan State and Notre Dame, and I've already got my hands full. So. Um, they're both, Notre Dame in particular, you know, it's, it's nice to be in Latin America. We've gone to a Catholic school at all, because there's always a priest that's kept the alumni club <laughs> going. Right? Um, yeah, what areas? But I think anything that is related, I mean, we keep talking about STEM, about science, technology, engineering, that, but how to make that relevant, how to, to make, you know, the way we talked about making democracy relevant to every citizen. So how do you take science and engineering and math and make it relevant to every citizen every day or to a large number of citizens to make their lives better. Because even though 40 million people have come out of poverty in Brazil into the middle class, there's still a lot of poor people. You know, there's a lot of poor people around. Latin America is still the most unequal region of the world, right? They still have the largest percentage of rich people um, um, taking out more of the, of, the of the national wealth of these countries and the, and the you know, smallest percentage of, of poor people participating fully in, in the country's economy. So I think if, you know, that's, if, if I need the answer to your question, I wouldn't be here. I would be the Bill Gates of economic development or something. But, but I mean, I really think that that's the key. Where do you take this digital education, right? So how do you get this laptop for child to, I, I got to tell you the laptop story. I, this is not, I'm sorry. Am I going on too long? No. no. Okay. So, I, so I, I, I went to get um, my nails done a few weeks ago. And um, so I'm sitting in this place, and it's all the madamis, right, who are in there getting their nails done. All the, you know, I mean, the upper middle class, upper class women are getting their nails done. And so uh, some of them bring their children, and some of, the, um, of them, uh, because of course the kids need to be watched while they're getting their nails done, bring their nannies. Um, and domestic, by the way, this is a whole other new thing in Latin America about the role of domestic employees, but anyway, but this particular story. So um, this one um, mother has brought her maybe three-year-old little girl and this older woman nanny. I mean, the woman is probably, I mean, she looked 70. She was probably, you know, 60 maybe, right? She's worked hard all her life. And so the little girl is playing with an iPad. Okay, so... To me, the remarkable thing was not that this three-year-old's playing with an iPad, because three-year-olds at a certain level of society in all countries are playing with iPads these days, right? 
with this nanny, this 60-year-old woman, and I don't know what kind of education she has, but if she had had a good education, she wouldn't be a nanny at her age now, right? And she probably had no opportunity when she was growing up. And she's sitting there with that iPad going, no, no, don't touch this one. This one has music. No, no, the ABCs are over here. And, and I just thought, you know, here's a woman who probably never thought she would be able to work a computer, and she's sitting here with this iPad, and it's part of her daily life. So that made me have hope. You know, for sort of not just Latin America, but for that class of, of people around the world, you know, who have been marginalized, who never saw hope, who never thought that they would do certain things and they're doing them now. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, did that answer your question? No. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.